Coleman, do you ever hear of him? He's yeah, there. I remember Carl. I used to go to his shop years ago. He used to sell 32s. Tricos? Uh, and midges. Yeah. You remember that, the 32s he had? I had a friend, I brought him in there, and he goes, I don't, there's no way you could actually hook a fish and land it with 32. And he goes, come over here, I'll bury it in the tip of your thumb. I can drag you all the way around the <laughs> shop. <laughs> so <it's just> a, <clears throat> Good way to prove the point. <laughs> is he still around? He is, but I he's I think he's pretty pretty sick and elderly. Yeah. So yeah, I remember his shop on Route 104. So guidance. Is he really? Yeah, still heading the trip. Is he? I didn't know that. He's a character. It's hard to meet Carl and not remember him. Yeah, he was. He's a great guy. So we are at 30. Can't tell. I think the Facebook working with me. 30. You got the chat up. Good. Right, I got a monitor then. Don't I? Your next meeting for stuff green, did you say April say? Yeah. In March, it's about an hour. Presentation for us, and then April, we have a film and a film program for us on Block Street. That'll be good. I'm going to have to plan a day with him. <clears throat> See, how are we doing intros? You want to introduce folks? It's up to you. Yeah. You would, um, Where do I, how do I do it? Where do I sit? Um, Where do I sit? I can I'm going to just belt it out. You can, I mean, you could really, you know, it looks like you see folks on Facebook. Uh, they're starting to appear. Okay. Cool. Up, to, up to five. Cool. You know, give me one more minute. Uh, you got Zoom going too? They'll just work on Zoom. And you guys got the technical setup nailed down. Yeah, it's taking a long time. And, uh, you know, it could go down too. <laughs> Don't say that. Uh. <laughs> right. I got WENY beat. Um, Profile, oh, nice profile. No, I'm kidding. I'm gonna zoom on. Oh yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah. Ask for it. <laughs> this is fair, right? That's right. This how this work? Yeah, we're good. You just talk into it. Ready yeah, to talk? Close. Yeah. Are we ready to go? Yeah, we're ready to go. Okay, so we're gonna get started uh, tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce. Cal Curtis and Jesse Hollenbeck. Uh, Jesse and Cal are both members of the Seth Green Trout Unlimited uh, group in Rochester, and uh, they, we're lucky to have them come down and visit us today. Uh, Jesse's also a fly fishing guide for trout and steelhead, so if you're looking for a guide uh, to take you out on any of the trips in our local area or up on the 
Ontario Trips. He's a good one. Uh, we recommend him. Um, so tonight, these guys are going to be, Kale and, and, and Jesse are going to be talking about Oaxaca Creek and Spring Creek, which are two very highly high quality streams in the Rochester area. Uh, they plan to talk about the hatches they get on these streams, uh, what flies they use for the various hatches and how they approach the streams. And, uh, they also then plan to also talk a little bit about the stream improvements that they've done on, uh, on Spring or Watka Creek, right? They've done some very innovative stream improvements and I, might, I hear they're pretty successful. So we're gonna hear about that. And these two streams are not only prime destinations for club members if they wanna check out something new much of what they're going to be talking about today, the same flies apply to a lot of our area streams. So we see a lot of them here. We see a lot of them in the northern tier of PA streams. So a lot of good information. So Cal is going to kick things off by a fly tying demonstration, followed by the presentation after a few brief club, club announcements from TC Owens. Awesome. All right. Thanks, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for inviting us down to beautiful, beautiful uh, Corning, New York. I uh, like this town a lot. And um, yeah, so I'm here today. I, uh, I grew up fishing in Awaka Creek pretty much my whole life. That's where I learned to, to tie flies. And Jesse is uh, a master of that water and the water in our area. So he's going to go through some um, particulars on how to fish it. But I thought I would uh, share with you guys a couple of flies or a few flies, whatever we get to, that I have used successfully at Awatka Creek and uh, I think could be used anywhere. They're relatively simple to tie, um, at least a couple of them. And uh, so if you're a beginning, beginning tire or someone even intermediate, you can tie these flies. Now I've said that and we're in a nice high uh, power magnitude, I'll screw it up. But uh, the first one I'm going to tie is a Hendrickson Usual. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the usual fly. It was uh, created by Fran Betters up in the Adirondacks. And uh, it basically, the nice thing about it, it, you need one material, and that is a snowshoe foot um, from a hair. And uh, one of the things that uh, I have found with the Hendrickson hatch in a Watka and anywhere is the wing profile is a very important aspect, in my opinion, because it's cold typically. And uh, it takes a while for the flies to get off the water. And so having some high wing profile is uh, one characteristic of, of a fly that I think is important. The second, and this is a secret, I'm giving up secrets. Um, you have to have pink and red in the body. It's really important. So if you have, if it's, it, they look brown, um, but this was a, a really a game changer for me. So, so I'll start. Um, and the first thing is that the trailing shuck and the wing is both tied with this material. The original recipe calls for the underfur to be the actual dubbing, but I find that um, difficult to work with and it doesn't really have any advantages. So I only use it for the, uh, the wing and the trailing shuck. So you basically get a, a snowshoe foot, they're like five bucks. And one of the, the cool things about Fran Betters is he, uh, he basically tied all his flies with roadkill because he grew up in very rural uh, Adirondacks. So he has very practical, ugly flies. Um, so what I did was I just, I cut off a piece right down to the underfur. And I like to cut off a bit more than I need just so um, I can weed it down because as you, I don't know if this is, yep. is that okay? There we go. And when you show material, you wanna show it right. Uh, right at the same plane. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Same plane. Perfect. So uh, you got to pull out this underfur so it doesn't build up the body too much. And you kind of get down to something like that. And I think I'll even narrow that down a little bit. But like I said, this, these, these guys have big wings and they sit up nice and high. So I, I like to tie my wing a little bit longer than the, the length of the hook. So something like that. And then there's a, a little bit of a move where I rotate and move hands here and just do one more measure. And so I'll get my thread tied on here. What kind of thread? Is it like eight odd thread? Or? Yeah, so eight odd, um, 70 denier, yep. uh, one of those two. And I, you always wanna put a thread base for those beginning tires, wherever you're gonna have this type of material uh, because it's actually quite slippery. 
So having a thread down will provide some foundation so it doesn't slip on the steel hook. Um, and uh, yeah, so I tie it about, you can see about um, one third back of the, the hook eye there and just put it at this angle. And then again, maybe a, a beginner tip, but if you, whatever direction you wanna pin materials on, pull the other direction to get it down. So straight up will really put some pressure down and pin it to the top of the hook shank. Got it. So if you can see that, um, and now the other thing you want to do is you want to have the trailing shuck and the wing kind of meet so there's not a bump there. So I usually trim a little bit at an angle there. And then wrap that down. You'll see what I mean when I do the trailing shucks. So then I go back to the front and build a thread dam to get that wing up a little bit. And they're going to come back around with some dubbing anyhow, but I just like to do that just to get it up. You can see you got this kind of oversized wing, which I found actually quite effective. And then I uh, prepare for the tying on of the trailing shuck by leaving the thread right around at the hook point. And I, this uh, piece, you don't need too much for the trailing shuck. And if you've ever seen a, you know, some of these really nice photographs these days of mayflies hatching, there's this moment where they're releasing their shell from the nymphal stage and it just kind of trails behind but their wings are starting to come up and that's really that awkward state that this uh, fly imitates and so i have just a little bit of of uh, this under fur again and do the same thing tie that on and then i do one up behind just to stabilize that and then I just trim off a little bit here so it matches up with where that other wing met. So you can see the body is a little bit smoother. Looks killer. Yeah. Looks like looking so this is 14. And one interesting thing I learned about bugs, I'll share with these random pieces of information, is as nymphs get bigger, they hatch first. And so they tend to be larger in the beginning of the hatch. So that's why you start like with um, sulfurs at 14 and, and sometimes you'll see Hendrickson's even at 12 and usually 14. As you get later in the hatch, the, the nymphs that hadn't grown so much start hatching. And so you end up with uh, a smaller fly. So 14 usually has you covered. So here's a, here's a trick. I have a bunch of different uh, rabbit fur. And one of the things that I, I found very helpful is to mix them. So I take some dark hair. They actually make a Hendrickson red and a bit of Hendrickson pink. And I actually mix them together. And you end up with this kind of tricolor impression of brownish red that is a, it's a pretty cool a pretty cool color and is really effective. Cool. So I'll just take a little bit of that, dub it on. And as, as you guys probably know, you, you start with you know thin and get thicker as you go. So just put a little of that on, wrap it up, and then try and get it like that. And then I'll do a couple just under the under the wing to give it some lift and make a head and we'll tie it off. So you can tie a hundred dozen of these flies for $12. Yeah. <laughs> if that's your thing. Yeah. I can see that color looks, looks awesome. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a guy named John Atherton mm -hmm. who you may recognize him. He's an artist. Mm -hmm. He actually has artwork in the, uh, Museum of Modern Art. He has a book on never using a single color of dubbing under any circumstance. Oh wow! Because he has the uh, so there's the there's the finished fly. And you spread the wing out. Fan, nope. Fan, fan it, just like that. It's just like that. Like a flip blown over sometimes. Yeah, it's the the thing about uh, Fran Betters flies. They look ugly on the vice. They look like these big hairy things. Um, but when this hits the water, it actually 
it floats because it has the trailing shuck and it floats right down on part of the reason of having it out like this it'll sit kind of so the body's almost underwater and it just kind of looks like it's coming out of the surface of the film you can tie this for all different types of hatches drakes every pretty much anything in different colors but um it's a really effective fly and the, the color snowshoe is it just dark or is it a special yeah color? so that's a good question um this is a uh, a brown a brown snowshoe hair and they come in yeah what's in it Almost. Yeah, I think that's the dye as it gets down yeah, in, you know, below the fur. Yep. It kind of ends up, but it is actually, if you can find stuff, like as I was saying, with a little bit of red or pink in it, you know, so it's even a rust there. or something like that, that's another one. Yeah. Um, and they come in, this is the one I use for, uh, this is the one I use for like a sulfur. But the sulfurs, the Henry, in my opinion, the usual doesn't work quite as well for the sulfur. Um, Fish are just a little more sophisticated that time of year. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a that's a great fly for uh, for April. So the Hendrickson hatch typically is sometime first second week of April, and uh, it goes for a couple of weeks. After that, we start getting into the uh, caddis season. So kind of go from Hendrickson into caddis and into sulfurs those are the big three really in my mind with the caddis there's a couple of different um flies that i like but i really like swinging wet flies for uh for on a caddis hatch it's really effective and it's fun so um, what i'm going to tie next is a wet fly and i'm going to tie it in a size 14 believe it or not instead of a 12 and i actually tie this sometimes in a size 16 and this is based on the lead wing coachman which is a kind of a famous wet fly. But I use a turkey feather instead as the caddis wing. And uh, I'm going to use the same, you can use brown um, or I'm going to use the same rust color thread. And I'll get that started. And what's this? This fly is made out of um, peacock curl as a body. And then it has what I use as a turkey feather, primary turkey feather segment for a wing, and then any game bird as uh, the legs. And so I have my strong peacock hackle. This is also a fairly straightforward fly to tie. I tie, did I say that right? I get two, uh, two peacock curls. And you can, I don't always, but you can also put some wire down to reinforce it because the peacock curl is a fairly um, fragile material. So I'm going to start with the wire. I'm just going to pin it down onto the side. Again, if I pull it straight away, I pin it right to this side of the hook. Bring it back. And then the peacock curls, I always start with uh, the end that it's essentially plucked from because it's got a little bit more of a, a stiffness that it's easier to tie in. Um, and so I'm again just pitting that against the hook and bringing it up. Get that out of there. And I end it maybe uh, a little more than a hook eye back. And then there's, you can either wrap them in parallel or you can twist them and wrap them. I typically like to wrap them in parallel, although they say if you, if you twist them, you get a little bit more strength, but I like the uh, fuller body. If you've ever seen a, a caddis up close, they actually have unbelievably fat bodies, surprisingly fat bodies. And I've noticed that. Um, so just hand over hand, Wrap this. If I had my material keeper here, I would not be struggling with that. And I'm going to put, I'm going to do one more wrap and I can come back. Just check that. This is just, it's the small wire, is what it's called. Um, it's from uh, Ultra UTC small gold. 
And like I said, you can reverse reverse wrap this. I typically don't, but um, and then I just kind of you can kind of wiggle it through. And most of this isn't really for flash. It's you know mostly for reinforcing the body. And I this one trick I like about uh, pinning wire down is I do one wrap over and then reverse it and then back over. So you can reverse the thread on itself by going around the wire, trim that off. So that's the body, no tail being a caddis. And then uh, this is a turkey primary feather. And what I do is I take a section about the, a little bit thicker than the width of the uh, hook gap and trim that off. This is also a uh, trick that I learned from Fran Betters, believe it or not. I used to go up to the Adirondacks a lot as a kid. So Fran had a influence on my fly tying. I actually learned quite a bit from him. And it, typically this is tied with the uh, paired uh, duck quills that you kind of put down on top. I just found this actually when I saw him do this easier and, it, and it, I found it to be more effective because it actually looks like a caddis wing. So basically you have a single a single um, piece of this connected and I just cut it off square for the time being. And I measure it out like that, a little past the hook bend, if you can see that. And then I'm gonna actually make sure I got that. You're not making a tent or anything or? Not really, you can. And then I pull straight up to get that in. And one of the reasons I leave this piece out so long is so I can do one of those trap wraps underneath and then back over. And then and pin that down. You can, as you were saying, you can pinch it. Um, what I do is I actually take this and just cut it at an angle now. So now if you can kind of yeah. take on that, yeah. that caddis angle. And again, I think the fish really trigger on those, on the wing. Um, and then I just have a piece of grouse that I put some legs on after. And so I take a, uh, this may be hard for me to do. You can see that pull one that's a little bit smaller. And I try and find uh, some fibers that are a little bit longer, um, maybe three quarters of, a, of the hook length, because you want, they kind of scream out there. They you know, do this kind of swimming motion and uh, uh, trim off. So I have a little square to tie on, and then I'm going to only use very little of this, like maybe that much, and I'm gonna peel the rest of the way. Uh, so you're don't want to overdo it. Let's see if I. I'm actually gonna cut that. Off. Sorry. So I'm not a lot left there. And I'm gonna tie that. So another trick. The thread starts giving you a hard time and you want it to go towards the back of the hook, spin it counterclockwise. It's not the, not the best tie on, but, and then fold it back and I just do a couple of quick wraps. So grouse versus partridge? Either works. Yeah. And could you tie it in the way you would just do it, uh, the way you would tie it in on the soft tackle if you wanted? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways. You can see, Yeah. I don't know if you can sparse. see it kind of, yeah. it's sparse and it goes a little bit over the top and the bottom. This is a, yeah, looks killer. this yeah. is a killer fly actually. <laughs> I have to admit, this one is. This one. 
<laughs> this one's nasty. You can tie all my. <laughs> There we go. All right. Do we want to do another one or do we, should we? Yeah. Do another do one? Another one. All right. How you feel, Jesse? Oh, yeah. Another one? Bring it on. Cool. This one's a little bit, uh, a little bit trickier. So there's a chance I'm going to screw this one up. But um, so this one is one of the very few times I have a fly that works for multiple hatches, in my opinion. So this is a. Uh, fly designed by AK Best in Colorado. It's called the St. Vran Caddis. And this is a really effective fly for caddis and for uh, sulfur hatch. So uh, for whatever reason, I think it appears to fish as, a, uh, as an emerger when the, the sulfurs are out. So let's see. It is a, because it's a sulfur imitation, I tie it yellow. And uh, basically what it's made up of is dubbing, yellow body dubbing, this for a wing, and then it is a hackled, a hackled fly. So uh, start with the, uh, start with the thread. On. Yes, so it is a deer body here. I don't, it doesn't really work with elk. And this one I do uh, yellow, pretty much bright yellow. You can put in a, a little bit of red as well, I find. It. So there's two different types of sulfurs. There's a sulfur that's a 14, that's bright yellow, and a sulfur that's a 16, and it's orangish yellow. And so I kind of do bright and orange, because this is one of the things about sulfur fishing, you guys probably have noticed, it's dark. And the last thing I like to do is change flies and the headlamp and all that. So having this kind of multi-purpose fly that the, the 14s will come off earlier and then they'll go to the 16s with some, some color. And so I, I can start with this fly and kind of fish it right through the night. Um, and the, the caddis is a carrot shaped body. Uh, so you start kind of fat. So I do, believe it or not, I tie this in the, the body of the caddis style as opposed to the, uh, as opposed to the mayfly. Even though it works for both, I found that, that kind of carrot shape. And you stop this one pretty, pretty early in the fly, almost halfway, because you need room for, uh, for the wing. So let me just this back make sure i have the room and so yeah this is a downwing fly so um i get a piece of the deer deer body and again i like to start with more than i need so i can parse it down and there's under fur on this deer body as well so you take that out and then I stack it Stacker. And oftentimes you'll have broken body here. So I just kind of pick those out. I'm sure the fish are looking really close at the, the broken ones. Uh, and I think this is a little bit too heavy. So I'm going to pull. I definitely err to the side of sparse when given the choice. Um, so again, they, I tie this as a kind of a caddis wing, just extending beyond the hook bend. Um, and I'm gonna trim off. So I have a clean, clean evens section and then straight up again. I'll see if I can pull this trap wrap off. So I found that adds a lot of um, strength to the to the ties if you can get 
one underneath and a bunch over the top. Um, and then, turn that right down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do the fly tires cheat and get that back. There we go. So now I gotta leave myself room here to actually hackle the fly. Let me see if I can do this without. Went a little further to the, uh, to the eye than I wanted to, but this always has this kind of fat head to it just because you're tying down um, a lot of hair. So the other thing I often like to do here because this stuff is really slippery is just put a couple of dabs of uh, cement on there. Any particular head cement you like? I do like this uh, Loon water-based head cement for this. It dries really quickly and it, it lasts forever because it never dries out for whatever reason. All right, so now I got the body, the wing, and what I have to do now is just a couple of wraps of hackle. So I have a uh, whiting hackle size 16, trim it. And uh, when I tie that in, I always like to trim off the bottom because it gives you a little more grip because you have some of the residual pieces still there. And I'm just gonna tie that in there. And then I'll do one, two, and three. And then when I try not to trap, I pull in opposite directions so you only get the stem. A little bit crowded up there in the, in the head, but you can still, yeah, I got too crowded on that. So that one's a little bit trickier because you're using hackle and you're using uh, hair, which can be difficult to, to work with. But. So that, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, that works like a charm for both an emerger and a, and you can skitter this as well because it, it's got both hackle and the deer hair. So those are, you know, those three flies at Awaka, Jesse's going to go through the seasons, but, um, you know, really starting in April with the Hendrickson, end of April, May, you start seeing caddis. And I usually, I love swinging wet flies for caddis because, you know, they lay eggs at the bottom. So they're, they're swimming to the bottom to drop their eggs off. And so, so they're very exposed in that kind of cast cross downstream, let it sink. And then as you're coming up, it's kind of lifting up into the current. It's deadly, especially if you're doing it like in pocket water and stuff like that. And then the sulfur hatch is just glorious because it's uh, late evening, June, May and June are just spectacular. Lightning bugs are out all over Awaka Creek. And, um, and so this is a great fly for, for that. Very cool. The dubbing on that was was a yellow dubbing. Yeah, yellow, and I put a little bit of red in that case. That's what I thought. Yeah. Because uh, it does have they have a really bright orange body, uh -huh. um, some of them. So it is a it, like I said, it's one of the few kind of multi hatch flies that I that I tie. Cool. That's all colors dubbing. Nice. Yeah. 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 I, I you know I really have become partial to it. I know it has guard hair and stuff like that, and sometimes, but. Um, I actually found that it floats quite well compared to like synthetic dubbings and stuff like that. I don't know. It's just a, the synthetic dubbings are fine, but I, I really like that. The other one I'll just mention real quick is uh, that I've become enamored with is silk dubbing. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's this natural silk dubbing. And this is great. You can tie this down to a size literally to 24 it's extremely fine so i'll use this as well as a natural material both of these just collapse around the uh the thread really nice so 
All right, well, thanks everyone. I made it through without cutting my thread off or bleeding, not bleeding. My daughter doesn't have a hook in her sock. All right. I'm gonna finish just five minutes late. Should I, yeah, uh, I'll leave this and clean it up after. Yeah. Oh, do you have your do you have the lavalier on? Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Um I'll make sure I'm looking down this real quick. All right. Anyway, so what else is going on in the
Um, he did an excellent job. And I also want to recognize TC for doing the visual stuff and the Joe's house to get that, get that all going properly. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just going to, uh, yeah, why don't we just, um, We'll, uh, yeah, Recording stopped. Yeah. Okay. Sorry.